Mr. Mark Selby, how are we, sir? I'm very good, Mr. Matthew Gordon. Glad, glad to hear it. It's coming up towards the end of the week. Um, I am very much looking forward to having my eardrums perforated by the sound of Formula One cars for the next uh, three, four days. Nice. Um, but I thought we'd we better catch up before I do. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, well still, still, still able to listen to what you say. So we are going to talk about nickel. Um, things are getting exciting out there. Some busy, busy um, companies and lots of activity. But we'll start, as ever, with the price. What's happening with nickel price? Yeah, so it looked like nickel might take a sustained drop below $20,000 a ton or $9 a pound. But uh, once again, it has bounced off uh, that level of support and sort of back up into the twenty. $21,000 range. Uh, again, still expecting some near-term weakness. You know, we haven't seen enough signs of strength and the bears are looking for reasons to kind of push things lower, but, you know, nickel continues to hold up. Uh, you know, the, the again, big thing we've been pushing is this great compression, you know, as enough capacity gets built to consume mat and refined nickel that comes from laterite ores, that should see LME prices, you know, sort of weaken relative to what they otherwise would be. But then the big discounts that we've seen for MAT, MHP, and NPI continue to shrink. And another huge step forward, I, you know, last week talked about the fact that nickel prices had come down a bit and I was, you know, pretty keen to see how that was going to translate through and, and was not disappointed. You know, we saw nickel prices drop. We actually saw nickel sulfate prices increase uh, again, which is part of that big restocking. And so, you know, we saw that discount, you know, decline by more than half. So, you know, we're not quite, you know, still got a little ways to go before we get back to par uh, for nickel sulfate, but, you know, it's it's definitely headed in the right direction. And NPI, uh, again, even with, you know, some pretty weak markets right now uh, in China, uh, saw only a slight decrease in NPI prices. So again, saw those um, discounts compress. Uh, again, that'll continue on through the next six to 12 months before we kind of get back to normal. But it's good to see, you know, that, that those trends seem to be uh, very well established. So let, let, let's talk about getting back to normal and what, what that actually means in the context of China, because obviously markets slightly, slightly disappointed by the, the news economics coming out of China um, last week. Do you think there's a kind of new reality for, for China? Can it, can, can it get back up to the kind of growth rates we've been seeing for the last few years? Uh, you know, what do you think the impact of that's going to be on, on nickel? Will it be, will it be well, I, I, I guess slight, slightly muted given the increased demand from EV or should we should we reset our thinking? Yeah. So the, the, the nice thing with nickel as a commodity is got a very, you know, it's you again, primary demands come from stainless steel, you know, as well as lots coming down the pipe from EV. But, you know, in terms of stainless demand, stainless demand is pretty well uh, diversified between sort of consumers, between fixed asset investment, between industrial production. So, you know, as industrial production shrinks, and fixed asset investment grows as economies mature. You know that's a typical thing to happen, and it gets to become more consumer-driven society. Then you know the, the nice thing is you know stainless, you know the, the where that demand growth is coming from, you know shifts back and forth. So um, you know it, it, I do think China is going to end up at slower growth rates. It's just trying to find a way to get you know the, sort of the consumers growing quickly enough so that they can not have to keep priming the pump. On the fixed asset investment, uh, fixed asset investment side, which is the government's primary uh, lever these days. Uh, the other part, again, as as China gets wealthier, you know, in EVs, you know, that's becoming a, a, that's been a, the main driver of EV demand market, EV demand growth. And again, for for China itself, you know, given the distances in China, you know, most of the demand in China is going to come from lithium iron phosphate. You know, it's not like North America where they're driving massive SUVs and you know, driving four hours out to their, you know, cottage uh, in northern Minnesota. You know, this is basically in town small cars, which, you know, LFPs ideally deal, deal suited for. So, uh, again, not, you know, the slowdown in China is, I think, going to happen, but not really that concerned in terms of what that impact is on global demand growth. Right. OK. Um, so and, and to, talking of kind of re resetting here, or should I say restating um, here, is that we're going to talk about a few few companies uh, and what they're up to. So it's always nice to sort of see what the big boys and the little boys are doing. And um, we're going to we're going to start off with um, Clean Air Metals, a small company, but what's the news there? Yeah, so an, a nice little PGM deposit with some nickel and copper associated. So that's why I'm talking about it today. They unfortunately had a, some issues with a historic resource that they had to restate um, some of the resource base, um, and so they've been going kind of through. You know, a nice, well-disciplined reset in terms of what that's going to look like. 
these things do happen from time to time. Um, but the key thing is, it's again, how you manage forward, you know, and there seem to be managed, managing forward, um, you know, it, definitely down the right path. They just announced the results of a pretty comprehensive metallurgical test program and, you know, got good recoveries in terms of platinum, palladium, what you'd expect, copper, you know, and nickel, you know, it's a lower grade 0. 0.2, 0. 0.3 nickel, and they're getting recoveries in a 55 to 57% range as well. You know, one thing with nickel that sometimes makes it challenging is you find it with copper as well as PGs. And when you have a lot of nickel and a lot of copper, the challenge is, is you need to find a way to make sure that you can get as much of the nickel into a nickel concentrate or as much of the copper into a concentrate to give yourself the most flexibility in terms of where you can send those items. If you try to sell it as a bulk concentrate, then you're basically driving right into the arms of Glencore Valet, you know, Belide and Jinchuan, which, you know, are effectively, you know, close to an oligopoly in terms of, of those processing terms, even in today's today's market. So, um, you know, they were able to successfully, you know, make 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 good nickel and good copper concentrate. So it's good good to see that kind of work get done. Right. And, and, and talking, talking of good work uh, needing to be done, a um, bit of news out of Polymet Mining, uh, Glencore picking up the, the remainder of, of what they don't already own for about seven, about 70 million bucks. Um, what, what can you tell us about that deal? Yeah. So this, again, you know, for any investors looking at U.S. mining assets, it's, it's you know, the U.S. remains a challenging jurisdiction in a lot of places to be able to get permits done, particularly if the federal government has to get involved. So there's been some wins out in Nevada with, with, with some of the lithium projects, but, you know, this, this project in Minnesota has been trying since 2008 to basically start construction. They've had permits and had permits taken away. Um, so the last news here was Glencore and Tech had agreed to merge a couple of their assets together to create one big, bigger project, um, uh, which made a lot of sense, I think, for, for both, both companies. The unfortunate part was in June, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who uh, has to do things around uh, water on federal lands, basically pulled the permit back um, and said uh, it shouldn't have been issued. So they're going back to it again. That obviously had a big impact on on Polymet's share price. And so Glencore is taking advantage of the fact they've they've continued to creep up in terms of ownership there over that since 2008 when they were involved. And so, um, you know, they're basically taking them out and taking them private. So those assets will be owned as a 50-50 joint venture between Tech and, and Glencore privately going forward. So nice thing is it seemed to be paying a pretty decent premium uh, to get the deal done. So, you know, not expecting any pushback on that front and, and that deal will, you know, will end up closing um, in the next few months. It's, yeah, in, in, interesting um, development there. But I, th I, I think, you know, Glencore and others are taking advantage of sort of low uh, ec equity activity and uh, low enterprise values to kind of pick up some um, good good projects out there. So um, well well done, Glencore, smart as ever. Um, Toyota, now Toyota, we've been talking about recently because they've kind of refusing to immediately jump on this EV uh, thematic. Instead, they're talking the game of um, solid state batteries and hydrogen. So again, what can you tell us about this week's technological breakthrough from them? Yeah, so this week is a bit of a grab bag. We will be jumping around. So um, Toyota, yeah, Toyota was a latecomer to EVs. They were really focused on hydrogen. They've now kind of jumped in and with the announcement this week that they're, kind of, you know, they're trying to, so I think, stake, you know, stake a, a, a point in the ground that, you know, they're, they're going to try to establish themselves as a technology leader in the space. Um, you know, so they've said that they're going to produce a solid state battery by 2027 that'll have over a thousand kilometers range and can be recharged in 10 minutes or less. You know, if they get anywhere close to that, that'll still be, you know, a nice step change versus versus where we are today. A uh, key thing I want to point out with the solid state battery, because after this announcement, you know, got got some nervous emails from shareholders. You know, this this solid state battery has nothing to do with the cathode, which is where the nickel gets produced. It's basically just the way that the lithium is in the battery. Instead of being like a liquid or slurry, it's basically uh, solid uh, solid metal, and it just facilitates the effective operation of the battery going forward. So the anode stays the same, the cathode stays the same. It's just the way the electrolyte uh, is incorporated into the battery design. So it's okay. good to see this coming down the pipe. But again, don't no, you know this is not a new battery chemistry technology uh, per se that's going to change. You know the amount of uh, metals used in the anode or cathode. Okay, okay. So we, we, we had a little negative story about M Minnesota, but we're going to jump to a state which seems to be eagerly, eagerly uh, uh, interested, invested, uh, and investing um, is Queensland. 
which I which I someone tells me is in the northeast of Australia. It is a state in Australia. Yes, 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 it is. Um, the the uh, you know again with the IRA announcements, and we've seen you know a number of countries that have some sort of potential structural strategic advantage. Um, you know, deploying lots of capital in the space. So, you know, Queensland, uh, you know, there's a few Australian states that are, you know, big potential suppliers of critical minerals. And so Queensland, you know, introduced about a quarter billion dollar uh, financing package. Again, you know, a bunch of different dimensions in terms of uh, new investment in both mining and processing of materials. And so they put a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, but again, good to see government stepping up, you know, to help um, fund mining projects. And again, for investors, all that means is the more money government uh, provides, the less money companies have to raise uh, as equity if they they, they do it properly. Uh, going to another sort of le- level of scale and, and something that's near and dear to my heart, um, you know, the Ontario government uh, has basically uh, stepped up um, and will allow, uh, provided another b- b- bunch of funding over $5 billion over 10 years uh, to, to uh, line up with the federal government, which is providing $10 billion dollars of, of fu- funding support uh, for a Stellantis battery plant. That that project got uh, was announced a few years ago. It was under construction, um, and they actually halted uh, construction on it. Uh, they basically said, uh, "Governments, you Canadian governments, you promised to match whatever showed up in the IRA, and we don't think you're doing enough to match what's there in the IRA." So it was about six weeks worth of negotiation, but now they're there. So you're looking at literally fifteen billion dollars. Um, in terms of funding. Now they've said, look at it's, it's all basically, it's not, we only put $500 million up front. You know, the other $5 billion is basically in terms of tax breaks, um, you know, that will, you know, come into effect as they're producing. So it's not really a handout from the government, you know, again, as a potential producer who will be paying lots of tax in Ontario um, based on the current mining taxes, you know, this kind of deal is, is very, very, very uh, hopeful for us. And again, you know, hopefully we'll get, you know, similar scales of, of tax breaks. You know, again, Solana, it's, I think is creating 2,500 jobs. You know, we'll have a thousand jobs, you know, close to about 900 jobs as part of our operation. So, you know, we'll see, we'll see if we can get there proportionally in, in terms of the financing uh, that's there. Well, the, the bankers love it, if, if nothing else. I mean, the, the cash is always great um, up front, but you, you can borrow, you can borrow against those tax breaks. Um and you know, talk about in, increased margins further, further down the line. I, uh, as an ex banker, yeah. I'm all over that. Um, yeah. Right, POSCO. Yes. Um, so POSCO uh, again, just to sort of this the scale of the investment is required. They announced earlier this week that they're going to spend 90 billion dollars uh, by the end through the end of the decade. You know, in terms of green steel, in terms of battery materials, um, and and so forth. So and green steel. So this is. Uh, again, I think if people are doubting whether this is for real or are they, you know, is everybody going to get involved here? You know, POSCO is one of the largest steel companies outside of of China. They're, they are one of the people that are basically building, you know, precursor cathode production. So they're taking, you know, raw nickel and converting it into materials that get used in batteries. So to see this kind of scale of investment, you know, was 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 pretty exciting. Uh, that's there as well. The other sort of nice news this week is, is Horizonte. They're one of the few standalone nickel companies left after Mincor Western areas. Everybody else has been um, been acquired um, and they're you know on track. Uh, they've got their mining permit so they can actually start digging uh, the material out of the ground. Uh, they're on track for first half uh, production next year and they're going to deliver a feasibility study in the second half of this year on the uh, uh, building the second line to take their production up to 29,000 tons. Um, you know, this is something, uh, again, I think that the company's done a good job sort of under us, you know, again, I underestimated, I think, you know, what they were going to be able to deliver, but, uh, you know, they've definitely shot the lights out so far and, uh, look forward to seeing, you know, that new production come online. Cause as I said, many times we need it all. We do need it all. We do need it all. Um, and I, I guess finish off with just, you know, one of Mr. Forrester, um, BHP and uh, Wailu are doing a job of you know, wrapping up everything that's out there. Um, they've reached ninety percent ownership of Mincor now, haven't they? Yeah, so that threshold they can basically mandatory close out the the transaction. And what was what was more curious is around some of the news stories on reaching that milestone. You know, it was basically made clear that they're not done doing nickel acquisitions. So 
again, the, you know, why Lou as a private equity group, you know, has a real, has a, you know, uh, is, is not afraid to just buy things for cash. So, you know, I, and they've been pretty aggressive to date. So, you know, I think for the remaining handful of assets out there to say, you know, it's, it's, it's good news that Wailu is, is, is going to come. Hopefully they don't do too many deals at these lower valuations, but again, you know, Andrew Force is a smart guy. So it'll be, uh, you know, now that the Mincore one's done, it'll be interesting to see where he turns next. Okay. Well, like I'm, you're disappearing in, from from view. I think that the sun oh. has come out and we're, we're getting lots of shadows, but you, oh, you're still there. Okay. <laughs> my, we, my we will aura. see you next week. Your, your aura, right. <laughs> I can see it. We will see you next week for more news. Appreciate it, Mark. See you. Sounds good.